Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Beth Mascheski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. A few housekeeping items before we get started. You can download the slides in the handout section of the GoToWebinar toolbar. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be available for viewing online in about a week. I'll be sending out an email to everyone who registered for the webinar once those are available. Everyone will remain muted for the entire webinar. You can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar at any time, and I'll be reading those to the speaker at the end. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Carol Jo Morgan. Carol Jo is co-founder of the Idea Store, a nonprofit creative reuse center in Urbana, Illinois. She earned her master's in social work specializing in geriatrics and a master's of science specializing in environmental and conservation psychology, both from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Using those two degrees, it is her desire that consumers understand and practice daily diversion of reusable items and materials from the waste stream. She was the Idea Store's first educator and has done countless hours of sorting donations, recycling and hauling, volunteer training, public speaking, coordination of its major fundraising events, and serves on the board of directors. So Carol Jo, thank you for joining us and the webinar is yours. Hi, thank you everyone for your interest in creative reuse and uh, we're gonna give you some lessons from the idea store. So on your screen, you see contact information for the idea store and for me. And I'd like you to meet uh, Ty, the, the gentleman who is um, displaying the ties at the idea store. Um, he came to us from Bergner's a department store when they closed and, and we've gotten a lot of our fixtures from um, businesses that uh, have gone out of business. Unfortunately, Ty now serves as our ambassador. If you visit the store, he will um, guide you about how we're handling COVID these days. And he still does wear ties. So what is creative reuse? Let's start with the basics. Uh, my definition is that it's the process of applying a thoughtful perspective, innovation, and a bit of elbow grease to materials that might be considered of little or no value, resulting in unexpected artworks, crafts, and functional items. And you see uh, on your screen examples of creative reuse. The, the ones on the left are um, a scrubby made out of a vegetable bag really works well. It's crocheted and below that is a, a crocheted um, placemat that's made out of shopping bags. And uh, the, the latter is further recyclable, you know, when it reaches the end of its life because it is made of 100% recyclable material. On the right, you see three of our wonderful smiling and silly volunteers. We uh, were do we were participating in a community event, and our mission was to teach people about creative reuse. So we supplied them with all kinds of fun materials to make into little art pieces, and then their their little um, creations were attached to those picture frames. We had drilled holes in the frames, and they used connectors, which is the way that we like to promote further reuse of creative reuse materials. So the Idea Store's mission has changed um, over the years. In 2010, when the store opened, uh, this was the mission statement. The Idea Store simultaneously supports and advances education, the arts, and natural resource conservation in our community while generating revenue for the Champaign-Urbana Schools Foundation. So CUSF was our parent organization, and they adopted the Idea Store as um, an income, an earned income venture, rather than having to go around all the time with their hands out asking for money. They, um, the Champaign-Urbana Schools Foundation, continues to support excellence in education by providing grants to teachers in their classrooms. Uh, these are public school teachers and they do all kinds of other things to help with um, the local uh, public schools. IDEA is an, an, was an acronym then. It stands for the, the tagline of the Champaign-Urbana Schools Foundation. It's invest, develop, educate, or um, 
elevate, achieve. So in 2018 and 2019, we, we um, were launched by the Schools Foundation to be an independent nonprofit, and we modified our uh, mission statement to read, the Idea Store is a nonprofit organization that fosters creativity, education, environmental stewardship, and community through reuse. So when people ask me, how do you describe the Idea Store? What I say to them is, what you see there, the Idea Store is a nonprofit creative reuse marketplace that accepts items and materials from households, businesses, and industry that might otherwise be recycled or landfilled, diverting them for reuse in education, the arts, and more. So the Idea Store is uh, not possible without the people and the stuff. So we'll talk about the people first. We serve and are supported by these categories of people. Donators are the ones that supply us with materials. And these would include, um, they may come from people who are downsizing their homes. They may be estate heirs, U of I students who are leaving and want to donate their materials rather than moving them. Um, people who just plain want to support reuse. There are so many of those out there, and that includes people from business and industry. Shoppers, <laughs> we get the stuff in. We have to have people take the stuff away. So shoppers include crafters and artists, as you might imagine. Teachers, of course, group leaders, families, especially those with children, um, certainly students of all ages business owners, and uh, equal-minded people. And finally, a surprise to us, but not any longer, was that we see a lot of pickers. And those are people who are out there looking for things that they can turn around and resell. Donors are the ones who give us money, just outright give us money. And that's <laughs> we can't do without the donors. Volunteers, of course, um, are to the heart of our nonprofit organization. The youngest one that's ever served us was age six and she would come with her mother. The eldest was age 97 and came with his healthcare aid and they sorted pens and pencils. Of course, um, we can't uh, operate in a vacuum. We exchange items with other nonprofit organizations and we very deliberately build good relationships with them. So about the stuff, <laughs> we have a lot of stuff. We have a, a donation guide of accepted items. You'd find that on our website. There's a, a, clear, a clear list of what kinds of things we accept. And then a lot of people can extrapolate from that other things that are not on the list or you know, people always call and say, I don't see it, but do you take blah, blah, blah. And the answer is usually yes, unless it's something really weird. Um, we take traditional materials. Um, the person on the left side of the screen is Stacy Gross, she's a fantastic arts instructor at Centennial High School in Champaign. She was there that day getting fabric and yarn for class projects. We also take unconventional materials. We really love those because it really makes people's brains click in and work a little differently. The kinds of things that we accept are lots of miscellaneous quantities of plastics, metal, wood, and glass shapes. Um, if you look at the display there, you'll see, for example, that there are um, slides, photo slides, in the third level down. And just a couple of bins over from that, you'll see magnetic letters that, of course, you stick on the refrigerator. There are all kinds of other things in there that I have no idea about. I don't know what they were originally used for, and frankly, we don't care. It's all about what it could be rather than what it used to be. We, there are things that we do not accept, as you might imagine. Um, of course, anything related to safety. Uh, we require that things be clean and safe. Um, and we don't accept personal care or medical items. And we um, turn away culturally or racially insensitive materials as well. Uh, and of course, there are other things, category, whole categories of things we don't accept, like clothing, furniture, house paint. There are other organizations here in town that specialize in those things. We want the things that fill a certain niche. 
All right. So we use um, in displaying the things that are available, both unconventional and commercial displays. You probably recognize those yellow containers on the left if you have cats. Those are cat litter containers and they've been made into a display because we want people to always be thinking not just about the little stuff, but about the bigger picture. We also have um, commercial displays that we've gotten through Preservation and Conservation Association here in town. These, this shelving came from a health food store that was in Champaign-Urbana for many, many years. So it's really great that we were able to have people walk in and think, this stuff looks familiar. This shelving looks familiar. So the uh, unconventional materials that are in the unconventional storage on the left are pop tabs, keys. You can see there are golf balls there. There are marbles, bottle caps, um, many, many other things. You can see that we try to organize things in a way that they look easily shoppable um, because who wants to walk in and buy something in a messy place? So our goal is always to have people walk in and go, how in the world do they keep this so straight? It takes a lot of volunteers and staff. So these are the, the teams, um, the, the people who make the team, um, the person on your screen was a, a staff member with us. And you can see, um, I would like you to kind of take a mental picture of the, the alley. You can see that we, at this point in time, thankfully have shelving to store donations uh, on. This is the receiving alley. And so, of course, um, it, this is one of our, was one of our receivers. He's no longer with us, but loves us anyway. We also have a recycler hauler, and that's a paid staff person. Uh, receivers were originally all volunteer, and now they're they're mostly paid staff. Sorters, of course, are the people who go through the donations and get everything in order. Those are volunteers and staff at this point. We have stockers. Those are the people who put things on the floor for people to purchase. Again, mostly staff at this point, but there are volunteers who do that as well. Cashiers are now all paid staff members. We have had educators through the years, uh, as I was, as was mentioned, I was the first one. We do have a paid um, educator who can't wait to start her job because of COVID. She's really been kind of stuck. Uh, we have special sales organizers. I'm one of those. I oversee the jewelry jackpot, which is uh, our largest fundraiser for the store. We have an executive director who also is the manager of the store. She, of course, is paid staff. And um, we have a board of directors. I have never been a paid staff person, never want to be. I love what I do as a volunteer. We have, by the way, 10 staff people at this point. We um, focus on environmental stewardship. This is the reason that I wanted our community to have a creative reuse center. And what we did um, and what we continue to do is fill a niche, that gap, of the taking the things that a lot of people would throw away and instead showing people what they could do with them and, and making use of them, making them available at low cost. We divert materials obviously from the waste stream every single time donations come in the door um, through accepting donations. We do practice daily reducing, reusing and recycling. We accept, we are not a recycling center and we, we state that very clearly to people. Don't bring us your recyclables. We are not a recycling center. But in the course of our daily activities, we do recycle and practice recycling. Besides the usual things, we also um, take electronics to the places where they need to go, batteries from households that come in with donations, um, ink cartridges that um, are out of things that have been donated, fabric, plastic bags, and occasionally we get the weird stuff that has to go to the Household Hazardous Waste Collection Day. We um, really focus on building relationships. We have good partnerships and that are environmentally oriented as well. Master naturalists help us with sorting. I happen to be a master naturalist myself. This is how we earn our um, hours for accreditation every year. 
we partner too with Habitat for Humanity and Salt and Light especially. And you can see on your screen the redonate bins that are in receiving. The next picture shows you um, where the volunteers are working. We have um, trash uh, containers, so that's the one with the yellow bands on it, and then plastic bags go in the plastic bag container, and those are taken to the grocery store. The, uh, the containers that you see on the right are, um, uh, two of them serve the entire part of the mall that we're in, in Lincoln Square in Urbana. And the one on the, the left is trash, the one in the middle is cardboard, and then the one on the right is uh, our own bin for Holloway Recycling. We contract with Midwest Fiber, so our, our uh, recycler hauler hauls other things besides what goes in there. Okay, here's where we get to some big lessons. <laughs> We've had a lot of challenges, as you might imagine. Logistically, it, it was just, it can be nightmarish, uh, just mainly because of the sheer volume of donations that people want to give us. Now, we love getting the donations, but a, a clear lesson to anybody who's interested in starting this is to be sure that you tell people, make it clear to them, this is our mission, this is what we accept, this is what we don't accept, and this is why. Um, of course, that sheer volume of donations forces continued growth. Uh, so does popularity, so we're very grateful for that. And that growth brings with it resulting expenses. Um, we've had certainly our share of growing pains um, financially. It's a good thing, but it's also been a challenging thing through the years. We often have to deal with, not as often as we used to, the receipt of true waste. We do check donations as they come in and we decline things and explain to people why we don't accept them. That's a big lesson that any creative reuse center needs to, um, to have and pay attention to. Maintaining staffing is, has always been challenging and but the people you know who work with us are very dedicated and we have a wonderful team um, and we do continue to get people who are really drawn to our mission and who really love the work. Every time we've expanded, we've had to stabilize again. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go through further. And of course, <laughs> the elephant in the room is COVID-19. Remember that I asked you to take a snapshot of our receiving. This was our receiving in our original home on Springfield Avenue in Champaign. And uh, we're very grateful now to have shelving. <laughs> okay. All the challenges have, of course, been dealt with, and, and we have had great out outcomes as a result. Generosity in our community is overwhelming. It, it's just amazing. The uh, support and cooperation that we've had from the community reuse sector, not just Habitat and other places like that, but also things like clothing resale stores and um, the antiques dealers in town and PACA, just incredible, incredible. We have even more dedicated supporters than ever before. Grateful for every single one of them. Timing has been on our side. Uh, the idea store rode the crest of the wave in um, 2010 when there were gobs of books out th about creative reuse and in fact here's one of them a thousand ideas for creative reuse a bible for anybody doing creative reuse center there were shows just geared toward creative reuse and workshops that people were looking for because they wanted to learn how to do this. And we built on that momentum. We were lucky. We were really fortunate. So, you know, watch for signs that this is uh, coming back around again. The economy actually worked in our favor because when we went through the recession earlier in the decade, we were able to weather it pretty well because of having desirable materials at low cost for people who were on tighter budgets. In our new space, we are so grateful to have increased accessibility. We're all on one level. We're on a great bus line. 
we have free parking and we have wider aisles so how do you ask did we get here well we had successful startup process and this is critical for anybody who wants to start a creative reuse center seeing and confirming the need is critical don't start something if there's not a need for it recognizing the potential is also crucial um, we recognize the potential of having a creative reuse store in a progressive university community that's been key for us and it's been incredibly important to have that student turnover because it's it's the idea store is always fresh there's always a fresh audience for us we did tons of research mostly online but um, also uh, my co-founder and i visited lots of creative reuse centers um, i'll show you models of those later on and we analyzed the systems of the places that we visited trying to figure out what would work best for champaign urbana community let's see seeking guidance from a successful world model i went to the scrap exchange in durham north carolina and shadowed them for a week they at that time were 20 years old and i figured hey <laughs> they're doing something right and they're in a university community comparable in size to us at the time that i went community buy-in and collaboration was critical for a successful startup um, there was an incredible ripple effect of support you put the word out that something exciting is about to happen and you'll know pretty soon whether the community is going to support you we have tons of wonderful excited committed volunteers People initially were drawn to us because they were intrigued by the concept of creative reuse and wanted to see how in the world this was going to actually work. So this is how it started. We did um, great giveaway events. There were two, one in 2007. This is a photo from there. Fortunately, my husband and I um, bought a, an older home that happened to come with a five car garage. So we tested to see what kinds of things people would be interested in creatively reusing. The people who came to the first event were just art teachers from the local public schools. In 2008, we did a second one and we invited all the Champaign-Urbana schools uh, teachers and um, we, we actually me took measurable or took measurements we gathered data and the teachers who came took away literally a ton of material, literally a ton of material. It was pretty amazing. Neatly organized, a taste of what was to come if we were able to get a creative reuse store up and running. So um, Gail Ross from the Champaign-Urbana Schools Foundation came to that great giveaway and she said, oh my gosh, I get it now. I see what you were talking to me about. And so they made the decision to adopt the, the schools or the, um, the idea of a creative reuse store. We did some trial events. Um, we set up kind of a, a mini idea store at the CUSF office and teachers could come and continue to get things. We identified potential mentors and supporters for our grand adventure. We consulted with business pros. This is such a good lesson to learn. Uh, initially, I worked with SCORE, Service Corps of Retired Executives, but most recently we've worked with the Small Business Development Corporation here in Champaign-Urbana, and they helped us with our transition from being a program of the school's foundation to being an independent nonprofit. You can, you can start with a partner if you have to, um, we, there are pros and cons to that. It's something to weigh very carefully as a decision. Educating your target audience is critical. Um, we decided to not just serve teachers, but to serve everyone, which meant that the teachers kind of understood what was going to happen and what we were trying to do. And, you know, again, they spread the word and helped us with educating the people who were going to be coming as well. Big, big lesson, start small, scale up. Just, you know, be patient, grow a little at a time if you can. You're gonna laugh at me in a minute because I'm gonna tell you 
<laughs> we didn't even follow our own advice. This is our first location. We were actually on the north side of this building. The windows that you see on the second floor of the building um, were our expansion. Our first expansion, our second expansion was into the space below that where you see the for lease sign and then the second set of windows to the side there. That building was going to be torn down and we decided that we needed to move to our new home in Lincoln Square Mall. We did that over the winter of 2018 and, and 2019. The mall was built in 1964 and it is the home of the farmers market and the common ground food co-op. It also is home to other arts oriented businesses, their church spaces. It's really a model of a, a reuse entity, if that makes any sense. And uh, it's attached to uh, a 1923 hotel, which was supposed to be in the process of being revitalized. And we hope that that will continue to happen soon. That was the south entrance of the mall, by the way, if you come to visit us. Let's talk about growth. Physical space. Uh, we meant we opened on September 30th of 2010 after four years, four years of preparation. And uh, so we're now officially 10 years old. It's, we're celebrating. Uh, we opened it with uh, 10, uh, 2,000 square foot space. And in 2011, we expanded to more than double that with room that was the above space uh, for a warehouse and classroom and cold storage. And then in 2016, we uh, rented that downstairs space for our foundry, which was our classroom and event space. And that added, uh, added another uh, 800 square feet. Our move in 2018-19 um, to Urbana enabled us to have 8,700 square feet. And what we did to make ourselves more set for the future and more fiscally sound was to flip the percentage of warehouse and storage with the percentage of floor space for the store. It used to be 75% storage, and now it's 75% store. Big lesson. Growth in terms of volunteers and paid staff. When we opened in 2010, we had about 20 good, solid, really devoted volunteers and um, two paid staff, but one of them was my co-founder who already was you know, paid for her original job as director of the Schools Foundation. And then we had a part-time cashier. In 2018, before our move, we had 60 good solid volunteers and seven paid staff. In 2019, in our new location, 60 volunteers plus 10 paid staff. And we had more group helpers because um, we had better space in which to do that. 30 uh, more volunteers a week many of them from Alpha Phi Omega, which is a U of I uh, service fraternity. We also have volunteers, or have had, not during COVID, of course, but from Developmental Services Center and the Urbana High School, which is located very close to the Idea Store. We had a pre-dental student group who needed to earn community service hours and adopted the Idea Store. Corporate groups have worked with us, and Rotary, and of course, Master Naturalists my favorite. Here are some of our volunteers. Pam is not with us any longer, but I love this photo of her. This was in our old warehouse <laughs> in the original store. You can see why we needed to grow. <laughs> so plant, Pam was our floral steward. She took responsibility for that entire area. And uh, Shelly, who is at work in the volunteer space where they do a lot of sorting in the new store, Shelley is a generalist. She will sort anything. And it was really easy to learn her name because when she first started with us, she sorted all the seashells. Okay, fiscal growth. In the first five years, um, the idea store did what it was supposed to do. And we earned thousands of dollars for the Champaign-Urbana Schools Foundation. And those dollars, some, some of the dollars were turned into It's My Idea Grants. And those were um, applied for by Champaign-Urbana uh, public school teachers and awarded by the Schools Foundation. You know, 
we grew. We needed more staff. Space costs grew. And so we felt the need to transition to both um, independent nonprofit status and uh, to a new space. And it's paid off. It has paid off. I, the Schools Foundation set us um, up for success and, and have had our backs. And you know, we couldn't we wouldn't be here without the Schools Foundation. In September 2019, you can see that uh, gross sales had increased 31% over the previous year. And gross sales in 2019 in general were $237,000. So if you're interested in learning more about other kinds of creative reuse models, there are lots of them out there. Each of them represents its own mission and they, if they're smart, reflect their community's economic sectors and demographics. Um, as an example, the uh, scrap exchange uh, in Durham, uh, that, that's a big fiber community. They, they do a lot of textile stuff there. They, I mean, you walk into the scrap exchange and it's just, there's fiber everywhere. It, it obviously is very unique to that particular community because that's part of their economic sector. Um, the scrap exchange is a, an independent creative reuse store. There is a chain model uh, called scrap and it's, they're calling it a scrap creative reuse network. They have stores in Ann Arbor, Michigan, Richmond, Virginia, Baltimore, Maryland, Portland, Oregon. There's one in Humboldt County, California, and Denton, Texas. As far as I can tell, those are all still up and running, but you know it's hard to know right now. Um, and the third main kind of model is the municipal model. There are two websites below. One is for Northampton, Massachusetts, and the other one is for um, Hammond, Indiana. This That is part of the municipality, and it's a good option if you have a good, strong uh, government and people of the mind to support that kind of um, reuse center. How do, uh, how do how do people set things up? Well, a lot of these are members only, creative reuse sort, uh, stores across the US and around the world, by the way. Some are open only to teachers and others are open to everyone. And then there are some hybrids. Uh, I visited one in Texas where they have a open to everyone side and then you have to show your ID to get into the teacher's warehouse, the teacher's little room where teachers could go in and just choose things. So one side supported the other side. Some places give away materials for free. The, uh, the two below are good examples of that. Or things are sold by the piece or by the pound, which is what the idea store does. So here's the reuse, a, a photo from the reuse center station, sorry, in Hammond, Indiana. As you can see, uh, they pile things to the ceiling and they do have a movable staircase. <laughs> I did not climb that staircase, but you know, they went up so that they could uh, have the variety of things to offer to teachers who would come in and get things for free. The, the photo on the bottom is of the scrap exchange in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, that was our role model the scrap exchange. They have moved several times since then. They actually had a fire and had to start from scratch at one point. They are now 30 years old and they occupy 23,000 square feet. <laughs> Holy moly. Um, I did check their website to see how they were doing and you know they're they are really having a hard time um, because of COVID-19 and um, just you know all of the, the stuff that's happening related to that so we we wish them the best and we we hope that many of the creative reuse centers are able to survive the coming months okay here's a book that was published in 2012 you know you're on to a good thing when somebody actually publishes a how-to about it 
This is a, a good starting reference, asks good questions if you don't have to have a score or um, a business council that, that can help you get started. Get started. I checked uh, the website and there, I'm, I checked online and there are some copies available. So I recommend taking a look at that if you're in a smaller community. So recapping lessons, um, please, please, if you already have a creative reviews venture, support it. If you don't have one, look around and see if you have the, the formula and the necessary uh, climate to start one. Educate with respect and a clear message. We are constantly educating people, explaining what we do, explaining why we take and, uh, things, some things and why we don't take others. Um, make sure that you have a clear message. We have a clear environmental message, which explains reuse. Um, people ask us, what's the difference between reusing and upcycling? What's the difference between reusing and repurposing? You have to be prepared to answer questions like that. Recognize and value and, and recognize and promote the value of reusables is incredibly important. We, we really make a point of displaying things that are ordinary, useless, usually passed over materials in a, a way that elevates them and makes people look at them twice and think, maybe I could make something out of that. Hmm, okay. So, being careful about not just opening a, a cluttered place up that's full of stuff that somebody might want is, is really important. Building good relationships will help you in times like these. It's a real challenge, but you know, we're all in it together, right? Earn your way to fiscal stability. The idea store, as far as I remember, has never had soft money to work with. We have always, always earned our way. And I think that that is, is smart. It's like not overusing your credit card. Um, we've worked our way to this point and um, we were in good fiscal shape um, because of the, the school's foundation, which we had fiscally been supporting. And it's just, it's just the right smart thing to do in this day and age. And speaking of right thing to do, making, taking the opportunity and the chance to develop a creative reuse center in whatever form it might take is such an excellent way to help people do the right thing. Um, it's, it's a way to get them to do something really positive for the environment and not even realize that they're doing it. So it's a good thing to do. Um, I, uh, I think that's my last slide. So the, the email for the, I mean, the, the website for the idea store is there at the bottom. And um, because the, the uh, presentation will be archived, you all also have my email address, which was on the first slide. Okay, Beth, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> so we'll be taking questions now. Um, everyone will remain muted during the question um, session, but you can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and um, I will read those to Carol Jo. So we'll get started with the questions. Uh, the first one is, what was the cold storage for? And a comment, I haven't been to the store before, but I'm excited to check it out. Oh, good. I hope you do come soon. Um, we're really hoping we can stay open through the winter months and, and not have to close again. We did have to close, of course, when the state of Illinois shut us all down. The cold storage was simply an unheated space. And because we were receiving huge volumes of things that could be stored in um, a, a non-temperature controlled um, space, we were happy to get that cold storage space. 
I will tell you it was really hot in there in the summer and really cold here in the winter, but it allowed us to continue to take good donations and not have to turn them away. Okay, uh, next question is, have you ever tried to quantify the amount of material accepted from business industry? This could help illustrate the economic value of reuse to local small businesses. Absolutely. You know, it's the one thing that we have not been able to get done in 10 years. Fortunately, because of the way we do checkout right now, the computer system and the program that we use, and the fact that we do sell a lot of materials by the pound, we are able to capture some numbers, but that is um, has been on our to-do list um, since we opened. You know, we really wanted to capture those numbers. The Scrap Exchange, our role model, has done a really excellent job. And Jesse and I, Jesse Riddell is our executive director and manager. Jesse and I were able to attend um, a, an international reuse conference at the Scrap Exchange. And we, of course, learned all their, their tricks of the trade behind the scenes. And we, we learned from them how we need to go about doing that. I'm not sure that we have a scale yet. I know that we've been, there was a possibility of one, but that of course was one of the goals, the big goals for 2020 as we turned 10. We'll get it done. Okay, next question is, are you planning any virtual classes demos during the pandemic? That is a Jesse question. We get a lot of Jesse questions these days. I think that we have um, a lot on our plates right now. Um, in response to the pandemic, we have been selling things online. We've been doing the curbside pickup and we tried delivery for a while. We did personal shopping for people for a while. And then when we were able to reopen, we have, have cut back on that because we really needed to deal with, you know, having people face to face again. Um, we had a brand new educator, excited and ready to start her job. And within a month of, I think it was for within a month of her being hired, um, we were, you know, the state was shut down. So um, we've had to cut staffing in terms of hours. And I, I have to say that as much as we would like to do that, I don't think that we're going to be able to at this point. But that's a Jesse question. <laughs> Do you still take plastic lids? I think we take plastic bottle caps, if that's the kind of thing you mean. Um, you know what? I have our donation list right here in front of me. Let me just check. We organize it by what the um, item is made of. So let me look under plastics. Containers. I see containers. Hmm. It's been a while since I looked at this. I don't see the plastic section anymore. Um, that too might be a Jesse question. I seem to recall that the last time I was in there we did have lids available, but they have to be clean. What, um, when but, items aren't moving on the shelves, at what point do you decide it has to be trashed? I think um, that happens when we receive a good solid donation of something that's new that we need to make room for. Um, we try to, um, I'm gonna show you the donation guide again. We try to make sure that for every item that's listed on here, there's a bin on the floor because, you know, people are going to bring us these things. But occasionally things don't sell. We have removed items from our accepted items list through the years, and we've added other new ones. So it, it's, it's about what the market demands. It's just good business. 
What are some of the oddest things you have received? <laughs> I love this question. Are you ready? Most of them are organic, believe it or not. Um, I asked Jesse what kinds of things I should mention. And she said, well, tell them about the large animal skull that we received. Uh, I'm sure that that was posted on Facebook and sold right away. We have received human bones. Yeah, that was my reaction. They, uh, it turned out that they were pieces from a, a medical specimen, which is good to know. Um, I missed seeing the taxidermied rat that came in on a doll stand, but we were able to sell that for $20. Um, I, my personal favorite, which I found, uh, came in in a, a gift box, a good size gift box, and I opened it up and it had a beautiful piece of jewelry, a brooch inside. And I lifted that out and I thought, oh good, something for the jewelry jackpot, put it aside. There was tissue paper and I felt that there was something underneath it. I removed the tissue paper and thank heavens, I happened to like spiders because there was a desiccated tarantula in there. I suspect it was somebody's pet. And uh, we sold that for $5. Um, I, I actually purchased it and gave it to an artist friend who um, loves to make things out of dead insects. Something else that was uh, unusual, we have received things like condoms, not used, of course, just, and uh, we received once a, a good quantity of the yellow birth control containers, empty, of course. And another one of my favorites was uh, that we received a little tube of snake sperm that came in a Chinese herbal medicine box. We've received weird things like creepy dolls, We've received, um, this is not good, but we've received some dangerous things, which of course we, we handled properly. The most incredible, financially speaking, donation that we've received um, was a gold necklace, a solid gold necklace, higher carat, that is from the Victorian Edwardian period. And uh, we have a jeweler that works with us for helping us price things that come in that, that might be of greater value. And uh, I knew we, we'd receive something good when they, they did a little huddle of snap, staff and, and turned to me and said, do you know what you have here? <laughs> it's worth thousands of dollars. So quite the gamut. Can you speak more about classroom and workshop events on reuse the Idea Store has? Are there specific insurance concerns and requirements you have encountered related to those events? Uh, yes, uh, we have people sign releases um, to participate in things. And the classes are, are geared specifically in past. I'm speaking from my experience as the educator and the educators that came after me. We usually gear them to different age groups and then make sure that the tools that are used are safe and um, everything is, is controlled. Class sizes are not large, have never been large. And um, so we do our very best to orient people to the materials they're going to be working with, how to safely use those tools if there are some required. And we just do our level best to keep everybody safe. And we have insurance, of course. Have any artists created pieces using materials solely from the idea store and shared those, um, share that info with you? Yes. Um, one in particular um, springs to mind, one wonderful artist here in town, her name is Diane Adams, and uh, she loves to work with paper. She's a collage artist, and I know she works in other media as well, but her work has been published in magazines like um, Somerset, and uh, she's just amazing, and she'll come in and she'll show, you know, I'll, I congratulate her on her latest article in the magazine, and um, and I, by the way, I think those magazines, the ones that she was in, um, may have been discontinued at this point, which is a shame. But, you know, Diane has been one of our, our famous people. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's one behind me. These are examples of creative reuse behind me. 
the actually the 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 uh, picture that's to my my right was made by one of our own staff slash volunteers. Uh, she's a talented artist. She's left us now. I think she's way on the west coast, but we we do supply materials to famous people. The state of Illinois uh, used to host a website connecting users needing repurposed items with businesses trying to dispose for um, repurpose and reselling. Mm -hmm. Does that still exist? Do you know? I don't. Um, I know what you're speaking about. It was a materials exchange. And um, I looked at that several times. And it seemed to be not really something that we could make use of. Um, you know, I think, again, that people love the idea store um, because we get things in from so many households and businesses that and there's just tremendous variety. I know that the scrap exchange used to get pallets of an item from a manufacturer you know again they're a big manufacturing area and um you know those those materials would go stale with them so um yeah i don't know whether that exists anymore or not what are some of your goals for the idea store in the future oh gosh <laughs> Please let us get through the pandemic and be able to carry on our mission. Um, certainly getting the, the scale and getting the, the, the measurements going has been a critical goal for me from the beginning. And, you know, um, my co-founder and I, <laughs> the day we opened the doors, looked at each other and we knew that the horse was down the lane just trust that you know you're always running behind the things that need to be done the things that could be done just trying to keep up and and do the best you can day to day it's exciting it's thrilling it's um overwhelming it's exhausting it's worth every minute um and you know we have so many goals we really want to get the education program up and running because it is one of our primary the primary pieces of our mission statement. And I really want to um, improve the signage in our new space to educate, to continue to educate staff and our volunteers about what things they need to recycle and how to do that properly. Um, so I would say those are some goals that I'm aware of. Um, I, I know that we would like to um, have more donors, meaning the people who give us fiscal support, because I think we've we've tried several times, um, but we really we really need to get that we need to get that going to assure our existence and further growth. Big goals. How are people donating materials now? By appointment only. We um, accept donations only. I think it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Might be wrong. It might be Wednesday. No, I think it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday by appointment. And they are allowed only two um, boxes per, um, per donor. Um, Jesse mentioned to me to mention to you that because people are having to really think about what they're putting in the boxes to go to the idea store, the quality of things that we are receiving has dramatically increased, which is good news for the people who are coming to the store to get those things. We have a, a large backstock of, um, you know, the things that you just would expect us to get a lot of. Um, so you sign up online for um, a time slot and you bring your donations to our receiving door, which was located just past the 
the um, recycling and, and trash bins that I showed you earlier. And uh, staff will look at the donations. And um, of course, you can take a tax deduction because we are a nonprofit. What is your bane in terms of donating items? In other words, what do you receive a lot of which you wish people wouldn't bring in? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's been a while since I worked in receiving. <laughs> that would probably be another one of those Jesse questions. Um, certainly, I'm sure that each one of our paid staff and our volunteers who work in receiving would have a different answer. Each one of them would, would have a, a bane. Um, I can tell you that what I'm always delighted to see is um, a full jewelry inbox because, again, that goes toward our, um, our largest fundraiser. I'm stalling here trying to think, what would it be? What would it be? And I'm I'm coming up blank. Hmm. I'll survey. <laughs> I'll survey the, the staff and volunteers. You might have already answered this, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, what is the most interesting donation the Idea Store has received in its 10 years? Interesting. Well, for me, of course, it was that um, solid gold necklace. <laughs> Interesting, fascinating, very welcome. Um, again, I think that that each person that that works with the idea store would have a different answer to that question. Um, I think we we all have a real sense of humor. You have to have a sense of humor to do a creative reuse center. Um, we we get into fits of giggles about things that come in that that are just like what are people thinking or holy cow this is the funniest thing i've ever seen and i know they gave it to us because they know we're a fun group of people um yeah i <laughs> interesting interesting could be interesting like are you kidding me um and we've had a lot of that too If people bring in donations that the idea store can't use, are you able to suggest other places to donate those items? Absolutely. And that's part of the clear messaging. You know, when we turn away things because they're not appropriate for the idea store, we always tell people, you know, we can't accept this, but salt and light will take this, or this is more appropriate for Habitat for Humanity because they take furniture pieces and they'll take maybe depending on whether it's still on their list they'll take an opened house paint for example um, so we take what we can we educate we politely decline and always always thank people for their intention to give us things a listener has a comment on a creative reuse uh, they say, FYI, non-lubricated condoms are a great way to waterproof microphones for recording the bird calls. Woohoo! I love that. I will pass that along. I'm sure that those condoms ended up on the, the sales floor. Um, you know, we it, our customers have a, a, a tremendous sense of humor as well. So why not, right? <laughs> Good. Thank you for that. And then I do have another question. I wasn't quite sure um, what they were meaning, but uh, maybe you'll understand or you can ask them to type in some more explanation. The, the first part of it is what I'm talking about. Um, will that type of tool be part of your plans, which I wasn't sure what they meant, which tool? And then um, the rest of it is, um, do you have any recommendations where I could go to try to donate large sponges? Um, cork corkboard barrels plastic stripping and um, other interesting items that's probably a question to email to me directly because um, i may need to do a little research on a couple of those things that were listed i'm wondering if maybe the tool that they mean is the scale 
for weighing things. Um, I'm not sure. I think I need some clarification. So my email is um, cmjn99 at comcast.net. Okay. Um, what are some of the most unique creative reuse projects you've heard from your customers? Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, here's the here's the the thing that I really regret is that people tell us all the time, I did this with this such and such a material. And I'll say to them, please, please post it on our website or on our on our Facebook page so that other people can get the same idea. And you know, people are either shy or I don't know what the deal is. They don't follow up and do that. I mean, the tales I've heard from people about reusing some of the most challenging of materials are are, are just amazing. Um, I, I am constantly in awe of ingenuity and uh, the make it work attitude, especially in Champaign-Urbana. Gee whiz. That's a tough one too. I would say look at our our Facebook page and see, um, you know what you can what you can see there. But um, I will I will say to Jesse, we we really need to figure out a way to motivate people to put their astonishing creations on out there for other people to see. Could you tell us about the bottle cap mural done at a local school? Also, maybe the story about the fence mural around the downtown site, which is now a hotel. Mm -hmm. Those were in our early glory days of the opening of the idea store. Again, those were um, brain children of my co-founder, Gail Rost. Uh, Gail's a, she's a fantastic artist and art supporter. Um, Gail really wanted to make sure that the community saw the us uh, fulfilling our community part of our mission and the school's foundation mission by doing these grandi grandiose really out there in public uh, things the the fence around the hole in the ground in downtown champaign uh, was woven with uh, strips of billboard we used to accept vinyl vinyl billboard huge huge you know you'd see the, literally the kind you see as you drive down the road. Those were cut into strips and that fence was woven into an amazing, amazing mural. And it was up for quite a while. People used to go downtown all the time. I saw bridal parties have their, their wedding pictures taken in front of that fence. The bottle cap mural at the school was, um, the project of a visiting artist uh, who came to us as part of our creative reuse festival. Yes, we had a creative re reuse festival called Hatch. And um, that person, oh, what's your name? It'll come to me, um, came and led workshops and she also um, did this, this mural while she was in Champaign-Urbana with the local public school and it was made out of bottle caps and and was outside of the school um, i haven't i don't know whether it's still up or not but the store the idea store has um, a small version of a mural like that and last comment congratulations on 10 years carol joe <laughs> thank you so much so we have reached the end of our webinar. And so um, I'd just like to ask you what um, final thoughts you'd like to leave us with. You know, I would love for everybody to um, screw up their courage like I had to in wanting to, um, I, I will say this and please don't think I'm vain, but to leave a legacy um 
an example of, of something that's possible when a community unites behind a good idea. Pardon the pun. Um, I, I hope that there will be other wonderful creative reuse stores popping up again once the pandemic ends. I can tell you, I can end on this note, I received an email from a woman who works for the, the city of Springfield. Uh, she brought a, a group of people with her and we toured the store together. They wanted to open a creative reuse store there in Springfield and by golly, the email I just received from her said that they've done it. So, you know, if you want to, if you live kind of in our neck of the woods, or if you're a little south of us and you want to go see a new place, um, I think it's, oh shoot, is a creative reuse marketplace, um, www.creativereusemarketplace.com maybe. Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't remember that exactly. I should have had that handy, but it's in the city of Springfield. So let's let's grow more of these. Excellent. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And, um, we will officially conclude the webinar now.